Out of my bondage, sorrow and night, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into thy freedom, gladness and light. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my sickness, into thy health. Out of my wanting and into thy wealth. Out of my sin and into thyself. Jesus, I come to thee. shameful failure and loss Jesus I come Jesus I come into the glorious gain of thy cross Jesus I come to thee out of her sorrows into thy balm out of thy storms and into thy calm out of Dress into jubilant song, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of unrest and arrogant pride, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. Into thy blessed will to abide, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of myself to dwell in thy love, out of despair into raptures above, upward forever on wings like a dove, Jesus, I come to thee. Well, good morning, church. I greet you in on this wonderful Lord's Day. We give thanks to the Lord for making it possible for us to gather again in His name. Uh, it's just a reminder that when we gather, we are indeed gathering in His name, and we're gathering to exalt and give thanks and praise to His holy name. And before we do that, just a few notices. Um, a reminder, of course, that after this service, we invite you for a time of fellowship. Um, and then on Tuesday, we will be having our Bible study um, at 6.30, Tuesday evening at 6.30. Please do join us. We meet at Harbury Farm. That's number 77 Main Road. If you are still unsure where that is, please ask me, or you can ask Michael, and we'll be more than happy to assist you and point you in the right direction. But that is this coming Tuesday, um, we'll be meeting for our Bible study. And then also, we've got quite a um, blessed week as we build up towards celebrating and commemorating the Easter uh, time, the Easter period, which of course includes celebrating Good Friday, in which we are reminded of what Christ has done for us on the cross, and then rejoicing that though there was a dark and gloomy Friday, Sunday was coming, and indeed it came, and he was raised from the dead. And so to commemorate this time, we will be meeting this next week Friday at 10 on Good Friday, and, and we'll have a service in honor of what Christ had done and remembering the cross. And then next week, Sunday, Lord willing, on the Lord's Day, we will, of course, have our service, but with a specific focus on the resurrection, Easter Sunday. Um, and so that's what's coming up, at least for this um, week. Uh, Tuesday Bible study, Friday, um, Good Friday service at 10. And then, of course, Sunday, we'll meet as usual for our Lord's Day worship service. Um, yeah, those are all of the notices for this week. Um, at this time, we turn our attention to our time of worship. And so would you turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 48, or you can look to the screen or your pew leaflet. But Psalm 48 is our call to worship this morning, and we'll read from, one, from verse 1 through to verse 8. Hear the word of the Lord. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised... In the city of our God, his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king, 
Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. For behold, the kings assembled, they came together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic. They took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there, anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind, you shattered the ships of tarnish. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God has established forever. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy and inspired word. Let's pray and ask God's blessing on our time together this morning. Our Father, we thank you this morning for this opportunity we have to gather together in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, O Lord. It is he that made it possible for us to be here, Lord, and to do what we are about to do, namely worship him. We thank you for your grace toward us, Lord. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, whom you've given us in abundance, Lord, freely, O Lord. Rivers of living waters we've received, and he, the Spirit of God, leads us, guides us, and helps us to bring glory to Jesus. And so we pray this morning as we gather that you would assist us this morning as we worship. Help us, O God, as we praise his name. Make us fit, Lord, to sing the praises of Christ our Savior by your grace. And speak to us, Lord, even as your word goes forth, Lord. Encourage our hearts, build us up, stir us, O Lord, as we seek to live before you, Lord, faithfully. And so bless this time, bless our worship in song as we read the scriptures together and as we sit under the preaching of your word. Bless this time, O oh God. May the means of grace do what they are intended to do and give us grace, Lord, to love you and serve you even more. And so we thank you, O oh Lord, for being with us, for drawing near to us, Lord. O oh Lord, and we thank you, O oh God, for your kindness toward us. And so bless us now as we ask you these mercies. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with me as we sing our first and opening hymn, Abide With Me, Fast Falls, The Even Tide. Praise the Lord.
says the Lord. In life, in death, O Lord, abide with me. It's a wonderful hymn of petition, petition asking of the Lord that he abide with us. And if he does so, the hymn writer says, I triumph still if thou abide with me. Praise the Lord. Well, at this time, we'll turn our attention to the public reading of Scripture. And I invite you to hear the word of the Lord as I read from both an Old Testament and a New Testament passage. And all of this serves to prepare our hearts even as we look at the preaching of God's word in just a bit. But Isaiah chapter 60, verse 19 through to 22, and we'll read from verse 19. Hear the word of the Lord. The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous, they shall possess the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hand, that I might be glorified. The least one shall become a clan, and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord, in its time I will hasten it. Here we have a great word of promise and prophecy about that great day in which the Lord will establish us in that eternal city in which he will be our God, he will be our light, he will be our source and our fountain of joy. Our New Testament reading this morning is also taken from 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, and we'll read from verse 9 through to verse 12. Hear the word of the Lord. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. And here we see how God abides with us by us loving one another. And again, a reference to the abiding presence of God in that eternal dwelling, and even here among us as we love one another. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy and inspired word. This time we turn our attention to the throne of grace as we come and confess our sins and seek God's forgiveness. And I do want to always remind you that as you trust in Jesus, if you're a believer, that there is great assurance for you when you confess your sins. That God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That we do so not out of fear that God will retaliate in vengeance, but we confess our sins with the hope and the certainty that there is forgiveness for those who come to the throne of grace. And so be encouraged as you approach, which is why the writer of Hebrews can say we can approach the throne of grace boldly, with confidence, not in ourselves, but in all that Jesus had accomplished for us. We come in his strength, we come in, he, come in his righteousness, and we plead his merits on our behalf. Well, let's do so as we approach God. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the grace and wisdom you give us, Lord, to know that we must confess our sins, to know, Lord, that we must take note, O oh God, that we do sin, Lord. If anyone says he is without sin, he lies, and the truth is not in him, your word tells us. For though you have caused us to be born again, and you've granted us this living hope, O oh Lord, while we're still in this earthly tent, we are tempted, and we sin, Lord. And so we come before you, and we ask that you would Forgive us our transgressions. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Cleanse us from our unrighteousness, O God. Help us, O Lord, to live before you, knowing, O God, that you are in heaven and we are on earth. And our words ought to be few, Lord. There ought to be a reverence, O Lord, as we live before your face, O God. And so we thank you, O God, for the abundance of grace that you supply, Lord. So much so, Lord, that not only can our sins be forgiven, but we in turn can forgive others who sin against us. For this is how, Lord, we are to forgive others, O oh God, as God in Christ has forgiven us. 
And so we do thank you, O Lord, for the outpouring of your favor, Lord, and your mercy. Indeed, Lord, you are rich in mercy. You do not run out of this, Lord. We are encouraged, O oh God, that there will be mercy, Lord, for those who seek you. And so even as we seek you in this hour, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you make available for us your abundant kindness and grace. And so thank you for the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Continue to help us to live before him, Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Lead us, O oh Lord, by your Spirit in paths of righteousness. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with me as we continue to worship the Lord in song, and we'll sing our second hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Let's sing. seated. Praise the Lord. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 2, Zechariah chapter 2, and we'll read from verse 1. Zechariah chapter 2, that'll be, of course, in the Old Testament, it'll be, if you're reading the Pew Bibles, on page 793. In your Pew Bibles, page 793, just after the book of Haggai and just before the book of Malachi. Zechariah chapter 2, 
And we're looking at the third vision that the Lord gives Zechariah, and we'll read from chapter 2, verses 1 through to verse 13. Hear the word of the Lord. And I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then I said, Where are you going? And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what its width and what, it is, what is its length. And behold, the angel who talked with me came forward, and another angel came forward to meet him, and said to him, Run, say to that young man, Jerus Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls, because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. And I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord, and I will be the glory in her midst. Up, up, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as four winds of the heavens, declares the Lord. Up, escape to Zion, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Behold, I will shake my hand over them, and they shall become plunder for those who serve them. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people, and I will dwell in your midst, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy and inspired word. Let's pray and ask God's blessing on our time in his word. Our Father, we thank you this morning for the scriptures open before us, and we do pray now that you would open our understanding, Lord. Open our eyes, O Lord. Open our hearts, O God, and help us to see and understand, to know, Lord, and to believe, to believe and to do, O Lord. This is what we ask of you now in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most uh, famous hymns that comes out of the Reformation is that great hymn written by Martin Luther called A Mighty Fortress is Our God. A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Martin Luther wrote the words and composed this hymn between 1527 and 1529. Of course, it was written in German and later translated into English. It has been called the battle hymn of the Reformation. And when you read the words to this hymn, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. You get to see the sturdy, robust nature of this hymn, this um, battle cry of God's people. It's based on Psalm 46, God is our refuge. A mighty fortress, a mighty refuge is our God. Fortresses were military defense gods to protect and shield. Luther wrote this hymn in the days of castles, where, of course, we see the same idea, such as those of fortresses, castles uh, designed and built in such a sense to protect and offer shelter. And I was reminded of this hymn as I was preparing Zechariah 2, as it continues the Jews' endeavor to rebuild and to reestablish themselves in the land. And God provides them here in chapter 2 with another vision of what that will look like. Remember, they've spent 70 years in exile. They've now been sent back and released to go to their land. And after 70 years, there's a lot of work to be done in their land, in Jerusalem. There is no temple. There are no walls. The city is filled with hostiles now because it did not stand empty for those 70 years. And now God's people are returning and they are met with all of these challenges on top of that, they've got their own spiritual inner challenges to deal with. 
And that has been the case for God's people throughout history, throughout God's dealing with mankind, that we always in, have to contend with challenges outside of us. But if that is not enough, we have the very challenge inside of us. Not only do we find hostiles working against our faith in God on the outside, but we also find that great hostile living inside of us, namely the flesh. And so we see that they had to contend with these problems and God raises up Haggai, he raises up Zechariah to assure the people, to call the people to attention and to give them hope beyond the immediate problems and to give them a word for the future and a word of assurance. And that's really the context of Zechariah and to that point as well, the book of Haggai. This passage this morning in chapter 2 can be outlined along three main points. We'll see the glorious rebuilding. We'll see the glorious destruction. And then finally, we'll look at the glorious celebration. Let's look at that first point in chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, the glorious rebuilding. Remember, there's a rebuilding underway in Israel. They have newly returned and are seeking to move on and to move forward. However, as I've mentioned, like most things in life, they faced steep challenges and difficulties. Here we see, in this context, God gives Zechariah a vision, and it is a heavenly perspective on an earthly reality. That's in a nutshell what a vision can be defined as. It's a heavenly perspective of an earthly reality or on an earthly reality or situation. And this is what we need because we don't think heavenly or we don't naturally have a God perspective on things in and around us. Well, we need to be encouraged to have a God perspective. We need to be exhorted to have a heavenly perspective on earthly things because the earthly, worldly, the now things can become so consuming that we forget that there's a greater perspective, namely God's perspective on our reality. This is why we are often overwhelmed by the reality of difficulties in life and by trials that we endure. And the Bible's antidote for discouragement and anxiety is to set your mind on things where? Above. Set your mind on things above. It is the Bible's antidote to encourage us to think of that which is true Think of that which is pure, lovely, commendable, just, excellent. And this is a question to ask ourselves when we are overwhelmed by anxiety and uncertainty, to ask ourselves, what is it that we are spending our time thinking on? Because we are told to think on those things which are heavenly. Set your minds on that which is above. And so here we see that God gives them a heavenly perspective. He gives them a vision. In this third vision that Zechariah receives, we see that he lifts up his eyes and he saw a man with a measuring line. Now, I think this is a man as opposed to an angel. Verse 3 is very specific when it speaks of angels. It says the angel that was speaking to him met with another angel who came forward. But in verse 1, we just hear, or we just see that Zechariah lifted up his eyes and he saw and behold a man with a measuring line in his hand. The idea here is to depict one who is a land surveyor. This would not have been uncommon or a confusing, a confusing vision for Zechariah to see a man with a measuring line in his hand. He would have, he would have automatically understood that this is a man, this is a land surveyor. This is one who's coming to measure Jerusalem to see its width and to see its length. This is usually one of the first steps in building and structural work back in the ancient time and even today in trying to ascertain the territory and the land that is available, they would go out and they would measure the land. They're going to build a wall, they need to know the perimeter. They're going to be doing structural work, they need to know the land that they have available to deal with. So what must be sealed off and protected? And so there's a man with a measuring stick and he's going to do this preparatory work. 
This made sense as the people were busy rebuilding, rebuilding the temple, and with hostiles near and around them, they were desperate to, to get this wall up. But this was the first line of defense, and often the deterrent, the great deterrent from hostiles coming in is looking at this great and grand wall and being put off by it. But if the wall is susceptible, if the wall is absent, this is not a deterrent, it is an incentive to come and attack. And so, a man with a measuring line going off to measure the width and length of Jerusalem can be perceived as a good vision. It's a good thing. It made sense. In fact, measuring the city has to do primarily with building the wall. They would want to determine the boundary for the wall to be erected. And so they measure the width and the length so they can start, start planning to do this. This is why when Zechariah saw this man, he didn't ask, what is this or who is this? He knew what a man with a measuring line means. What he asked was, where are you going? Where are you going to do this? Where are you going? This comes as a welcoming sight for Zechariah and for the Jews in the land. This comes as reassuring and as a major positive in light of their concerns and in light of their experiences. Now notice that this part of the vision in chapter 2 verse 1 are introduced with the words, Behold, it's an attention-grabbing word. Behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. The word signals that we need to stand to attention and take notice. Take notice, stand and behold, there's a man who's going to measure off the perimeter of Jerusalem. And this would indicate a, 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 a word from God that the rebuilding is about to happen. That it's going, not only going to happen, that it might even be successful. This is good news. It signals something promising. It speaks of something positive. The rebuilding is taking shape. However, notice in verse 3, again, we see that word, and behold. So, Zechariah gets a vision, a man with a measuring line is going to measure Jerusalem, and then verse 3, we see again, behold, the angel who talked with me came forward, and another angel came forward to meet him, and they said to him, run, say to that young man, this is the man with the measuring line, run, say to that young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls, because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. And I'll be to her a wall of fire around, declares the Lord, and I'll be the glory in her midst. Notice here again, verse 3 starts with, Behold, an attention-grabbing word. What is happening here? We are told that the angel who was speaking to Zechariah came forward, and another angel came to meet him. The man with the measuring stick, he's gone off already to measure But here we see there's an angelic conference being held. Notice what the one angel says to the other angel. Run, say to that young man, the man with the measuring stick, right? Say to him, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls. Run, says the angel. There's an urgency. Go and tell that young man that what he is planning to do is not necessary. Go tell him what he's planning to do in measuring is not needed. The wall is not necessary. The boundary measuring it is not needed because what God is about to do cannot be contained. What God is about to do cannot be restricted, cannot be measured, cannot be limited. There will be no wall because of the multitude of the people that will inhabit this place and the livestock that will be there. The inhabitants of the city will be so many, it will be difficult to contain them with a boundary wall. The livestock will be so many, it will push out the boundary wall, and in fact, there will be no need for a wall. There will be no need for a wall? So what about our protection, Lord? This would be one of the immediate questions one can imagine. And verse 5 says, God says, I will be your wall. You will lean on me, depend on me, trust in me, and I'll be the glory in her midst. You see, nations erect these walls in the land as something not only to protect, but also as something to show off. Look at our grand wall. Look at what we have constructed. And and so it is their glory. It is what they show off to the other nations around them as a sign of their strength and their power and how impenetrable they are. And so they show this off. 
God says, I will be what you show off. I will be your glory around you. I will be in your midst. I will be a wall of fire around you. I will be a spectacular presence around you. I'll be your glory. You're going to show me off. You're going to glory in me, not your own efforts. You're going to glory in me, not what you're going to erect. You're going to glory in me, not what you think is supposed to be giving you safety insofar as a wall is concerned. He takes them back and he reminds, or this takes them back, I should say, and reminds them of Israel's journey through the wilderness. A pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God is with his people. God moves with his people. God's presence surrounded his people then. God's presence was with his people then. And God's presence guided his people. And God is promising them the same. He's promising them exactly what happened back in the, with the people of Israel in the, in the desert, in the wilderness. What do we learn about this glorious rebuilding God is promising them? What do we learn? What do we take away from this? Well, God always does more than we ask or imagine. He always does more than we ask or imagine. Not only measuring the boundaries, but extending it and making them greater than they could ever have imagined. God's plan is not limited to a certain ethnic people, we learn. But since the beginning, since Abram, it has always been that God, through them, will bless the nations. And here we see that it will be inhabited by many people. Many people. Which is why we see a reference to the multitude of inhabitants in Jerusalem. We today who trust in the promised seed, Jesus, and who look to him for salvation, we are here included in God's people, and we receive these very promises that God will be in our midst. In a sense, God is talking to them about us and promises that he would count us in among his people. Also, we learn God wants us to lean on him, not on the walls, not on earthly structures, not on man-made um, invention. God wants us to lean on Him, not a wall. We must depend not on man, but on Him. We must trust in Him, not something we construct out in our own strength. And we are prone to build structures of security around us. We are prone to build structures of security around us that often causes us to rely more on the, on the structures of security than actually to uh, lean on God. This could be building structures of wealth and depending on money. This could be building structures of people and depending on the arm of flesh. This could be building careers of self-validation and affirmation. Not that any of these things are wrong by themselves, but they are wrong if they replace God. If they replace God, whatever you are building around you to lean on and place your trust in and glory in, whether it is the arm of the flesh, whether it is the esteem of a career or the security of wealth, it is as if the message comes through this morning with great urgency, run, run, say to that young man, whatever he set out to do and measure and build, God is going to do more and greater. Do not limit him. That's the message that we see coming here, a glorious prom promise of rebuilding. We see the second point, a glorious destruction. God promises them a glorious rebuilding, but notice in verse 8, there's a reversal. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you, for he who touches you, the apple of his eye, behold, I will shake my hand over them, and they shall become plunder for those who serve them. There's a reversal we see here. Nations who plundered you, they will be plundered. The first part of the vision signals the glorious rebuilding with God's presence. God's presence being this wall of fire around his people. A glorious and prosperous Jerusalem. And now there's a sec the next section deals with this glorious devastation or this glorious destruction when God takes vengeance on his enemies. When God takes vengeance on the enemies of his people. Notice there are commands to God's people. There are God's people that supposedly or apparently are still finding themselves among the nations, still set in Babylon, which is why we see in verse 6, Up, up, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord. Urgency to flee the land of the enemies. Urgency to escape the land 
to the promised land, urgency to anticipate God's judgment on the wicked. Behold, there are two main lessons here. Firstly, God's people must not become comfortable around those who are God's enemies. God's people must not become comfortable. What does light and have in common with darkness? What does Christ have in common with the devil? We learn here that we are not to be unequally yoked. The Jews were told to flee, escape from Babylon. Judgment is coming on these nations. Judgment is coming against God's enemies. And there's a separation called for. And this is comforting and extremely relevant for us to know that these promises, it, it, it is true and it is to be fulfilled and we can take great comfort in it. It's not only the promises of rebuilding that should give us joy, it is also the promises of destruction on God's enemies that must give us joy. It must give us encouragement, especially in the day and age that we live in. We are told here, in a world so opposed to God, in a world with such a lot of persecution against God's people, God gives us a message of comfort. To the nations who plundered you, he who touches you, touches the apple of his eye. I will shake my hand over them and they shall be plundered. You know, this last week has been difficult in light of the news of yet another school shooting in the U.S. In this time at a Christian school in, in Nashville, as many of you saw, Covenant Presbyterian Church in Nashville, Tennessee. They've got a Christian school on their property. And a school shooter, of course, entered and shot and killed six. Among the six that were killed were three children of the age of nine. One of the children um, was the daughter of the pastor of the church. And it's devastating. And I told my wife, you know, this feels so closer to home, possibly because, you know, you have Christians here Presbyterians for crying out loud. Yeah, not that anything else, you know, is, is lesser, but it just feels so closer to home. You know, a church in the PCA where this a gospel preaching church where they meet like this on a Sunday, Sunday after Sunday. They've got on their campus a school and a shooter entered and shot six people dead, three of whom were nine year old children. And you think, what do you do? What do you say? How do you think about these things? about these atrocities? What do you tell this, uh, the parents at the school, the Christian parents at the school? Christians, right? Believers, those who trust in God, the pastor who stands up and preaches the scriptures week in and week out, exhorting us to trust in the Lord amidst the trial and, and difficulty. And here a, a terrible trouble has visited himself. What do you say? What do you do? What comfort is there? Well, we do not mourn as those who have no hope. And here God says that those who plundered you, those who touched you, there is retribution coming, there is judgment coming. The Lord said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And as much as God gives us comfort in a life that is better than this life to come, in a glorious heaven and a glorious eternity, we must not downplay the reality that not only is God opening up a new heavens and a new earth for us, but he's also dealing with his enemies and he's dealing decisively with them. And this is our hope. Those who plundered you, those who touched you, come out from them, come out from them. There's a glorious destruction coming. Where we read about this in verse 8, For thus says the Lord of hosts, After his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. We see these, la the, 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 these words of, of judgment. I will shake my hand over them. And we take comfort in the reality that God gives us comfort in difficulty and trial. But we also take comfort that the Lord will repay. Vengeance belongs to him. And so we see God will shake his hand over his enemies, over this world. And this gives us comfort. He's not only rebuilding us into a glorious people. He's also preparing to bring judgment on those who reject him and those who live against him. And then we see the third Point that we learn in this passage or that we see in this passage a glorious celebration which is why we read in verse 10 sing and rejoice O daughter of Zion for behold I come and I will dwell in your midst declares the Lord sing and rejoice O daughter of Zion God's people are called 
by God to celebrate and rejoice in His triumphal purposes. And we find at least four reasons here that they are given to rejoice. Four reasons that fuel our singing and fuel our joy. Notice, first one, God will dwell in your midst. That's what we read here. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. Why do we rejoice? Why are we glad? Why can we celebrate? We do so because God is in our midst and God promises that one day He will be in our midst and we will know this, we will see this. It will be a glorious reality and so we can rejoice and celebrate. What, what is not to be missed is that part of this rebuilding includes a very important presence in the city. It is not that of a wall, it is not that of a temple, it is not that of great wealth, and it is not that of great military strength. God's promises are always bigger and greater. And God prom God's promise here is, Behold, I will come and I will dwell in your midst. Dear friends, we are looking forward to a Jerusalem. We are looking forward to a heavenly Jerusalem where we will dwell with God and where God will be in our midst. Rejoice, sing. We will truly not only be living for God, but we will be living with God. This is the promise. Notice the other reason why we are told to sing and rejoice, not only because God will dwell in our midst, but verse 11, and many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people. Here we see the promise of salvation, the promise of salvation that extends the Jews, that extends Israel, that extends this ethnic people. Many nations shall come and join themselves to me and shall become my people. It's, it's this engrafting process that the Apostle Paul speaks about in the book of Romans. That we will be engrafted, that many nations will come. Those who are far off, according to Peter, the promise is for you and your children, and those who are far. And here we see seeds of this promise that Peter speaks about. The salvation that comes to the nations, the salvation that comes to the world. Many will join themselves to the Lord, and they shall be my people. That's covenant language. They shall be my people. The nations, the Gentiles, they shall be my people. The third reason we are told to rejoice here, and we see, for instance, in verse 11, and many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people, and I will dwell in your midst, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. We rejoice because the word of God is confirmed. The word of God is confirmed. We see God confirming his promise again that he will be in their midst. It's a very important theme that God is with us, that God is near, that God dwells with us, and that one day God promises to be in our midst. And we see the fourth reason we are told to rejoice is God is about to act. Notice the verse 13, Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. The, the picture there is that he's about to be is about to lift himself up, raise himself up from his holy dwelling, from his glorious throne. God is about to lift himself up and act, act in so far as rebuilding the city, act in so far as calling many to himself, act in so far as executing judgment on the nations. And that's why we see verse 13 begins by be silent, be silent, let the murmuring stop. Let the defiance against God stop. Let the complaining stop. Be silent. Notice the description there, all flesh. It is supposed to remind us that we are fleeting. We are here today, gone tomorrow. Our lives are but a mist. And it's, it says, be silent. It's, it's calling us to know our place and to know who we are. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord. For he has aroused himself from his holy dwelling. As we conclude, Zechariah's vision here comes in the context when Jerusalem is desolate. It is vulnerable as the walls are not set up to protect against hostiles. The temple is not complete and the people does appear to be disillusioned about their future prospects. Often our world looks like that. 
Often we look at our world through these eyes. And the church in this world can relate. This vision comes to assure them that there will be a glorious rebuilding of the city. Many, many will come and dwell in it. And God will be its glory and protection. He will be in the midst. This vision looks beyond the immediacy and the immediate fulfillment. And it looks toward that great ingathering of people, even those who are not Jews. And we see this in the New Testament church. We see this in the New Testament church. However, this vision goes beyond that to the great and ultimate time of consummation at the end. When will this vision be fulfilled? When, we will, when will we see the reality of this vision where God will be in the midst of His people? His people will be placed in a central location, dwelling together, that God will be the light of His people, the protection of His people, the wall for His people. When do we see this fulfilled? Let me read to you exactly when I think this is going to be fulfilled. Revelation chapter 21. Listen to these words. Talking about that Jerusalem, that great promise that God gave Zechariah. Listen to these words. Revelation 21 verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And you were seated on the throne and said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done, and the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, to the thirst that I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. You see here, uh, this promise and prophecy and vision of Zechariah looks beyond the immediate placement of the Jews in Jerusalem, in a desolate place. And God promises them that there's going to come a time where you're going to need no walls. I'm going to be a wall of fire around you. I'm going to dwell in your midst. And when is this time coming? The book of Revelation tells us it is coming. It is coming. We are moving towards this time. We are moving towards this new Jerusalem. We are moving towards this time where God will consummate all things, where he will bring time to an end and he will usher us into eternity. We read more about this. In chapter 21, verse 22, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord, the God, the Lord God Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. But its light will be the nation's walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Here we see it outlined for us, fulfilled for us. Who will enter this city? Who will enter this glorious city that Zechariah speaks about, that the book of Revelation says it's, 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 it's consummation? Who will enter the city? Only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Pointing to Jesus, John the Baptist said what? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the uncleanliness of the world, and thus makes it possible for us to enter into that city, enter into that city. We are not preparing, nor are we waiting for heaven where we're going to be floating on clouds and playing a harp or some type of um, picture that we see presented to us in these forms. No, we are awaiting a new heavens and a new earth where there'll be a new Jerusalem in which God will dwell with us and we will dwell within. And only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life will enter will enter. If you have trusted in Jesus, 
He has made it possible for you to enter the city. And this is where we're going, friends. It is after all Palm Sunday today. Palm Sunday, the Sunday Jesus entered Jerusalem. The Sunday he entered Jerusalem, where on the Friday he will hang on a tree outside of Jerusalem. Palm Sunday, he fixes himself on a colt. And he rides into this city. He rides into Jerusalem. And they throw before him branches, palm branches, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Bible tells us that later on the disciples realized its fulfillment. And what Jesus actually came to do. He entered the earthly Jerusalem on the back of a colt. So that we can enter the heavenly Jerusalem through the blood of the Lamb. And that is our hope and that is the promise. Zachariah's vision is for those who are looking to the Lord in hope when there's not a lot of hope around them. They are seeking shelter when there's so much opposition around them. They are desiring peace when there's trouble all over. They are desperate to be settled. Do you desire to be settled? To be settled, to be at peace to be away from the, 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 the trouble and the, and the tossing and the, and, and the movement and the displacement that we see in this world and the difficulty and the trouble all around us. These people were desperate to be settled when they found the ground beneath them constantly moving. And God settles them with His Word, with His promises, with His presence. Preparation for rebuilding, the promise of salvation, and declaration of glory. If you do not trust in Jesus, you'll be amongst those God has aroused or roused himself against to judge. We have life and death set before us, heaven and hell. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Place your faith in Jesus. And so find your name written in the Lamb's book of life. And so find your place in this eternal city secured that God will be your God, dwelling with you forever. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the wonderful and rich promises that we have in the Scriptures. Promises and words that we need, Lord, in this world of trouble and difficulty. We thank you, Lord, that you hold forth for us light and hope. And we do ask, Lord, that you would help us to trust you and to believe your word. Help us to look to you and help us to rest in all your promises. Help us to rest in who you are. God is our very present help in time of need. He is our fortress. He is our wall. He is our bulwark of defense that never fails. Thank you, Lord, for being for us more than what we need in this world. And so we rest content in all that you are. We are silent before you, Lord, because you are God. And so bless your people. We pray and ask you these mercies in your holy name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with me as we sing that great and wonderful hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. A book.
Please remain standing for the benediction and blessing of the Lord. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the fellowship of His Spirit and the love of God rest and abide with all God's people until we see Him face to face. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and have a wonderful Lord's Day afternoon.